Last time on Building Resilience, we were framing walls and roofs and talking about beam types. We, we find that we use a lot of PSLs, parallel strand lumber. And so they take these long strands, they line them all up so they're going the same direction, and then they glue them up. The moisture content uh, is really, really low. And what, what makes PSLs particularly interesting is that they are strong in multiple directions. So they're really, really uh, great for columns. We use them a lot for posts. In fact, in this project, all of our major posts are made out of PSLs, but you can also use them in this format or this format or this format or this format. There were also a lot of job site jokes centered around wood, but we cut most of that. Everyone out. wants to talk about wood, especially carpenters. This week, we're going to go under that framing and have a peek at the weak link in many building assemblies, crawl spaces. They're often a source of moisture that can rot your house and poison your air. Speaking of bad air, poorly detailed crawl spaces are also a never-ending source of radon and soil gases. Eliminating those means sealing the crawl space against moisture and also insulating it because cold surfaces create liquid water when they meet warm air. There are two crawl spaces in this house. I'm standing at the intersection between really old and a little bit old. This is 1910 and this is 2001. And this is an addition that was put on by another builder and they attach it to the outside of the house and they built it with the best of intentions, but it's a classic example of, uh, to quote John Tooley, you can do the, the right thing the right way, the right thing the wrong way, the wrong thing the right way, and the wrong thing the wrong way, but only one of them is right. And this would be an example of doing the wrong thing the right way. So what was wrong with this crawl space? Well, they used closed cell spray foam, which isn't, a, isn't, that's not a bad thing, but the problem is the location that they placed it, which was inside the floor joists, with all of this exposed soil below it. Normally that would mean that when we open this up after 20 years of it sitting here, that we should see a lot of dry rot. And amazingly, there isn't. And that's because, well, happy accident. They got lucky and the spray foam got underneath the cardboard that they put on there and covered up the bottom side of the joists. And so moisture from the soils couldn't actually get to the wood. One of the unusual things that we found here when we opened this up was this piece of reinforced poly running around the perimeter of the foundation. In fact, when we first pulled up the subfloor, we thought, oh good, they put down poly and that'll be going across the dirt floor. In fact, they didn't. They just put it on as a skirt of sorts. I have no idea why they did it or what kind of logic uh, they were pursuing. All right, so what are we gonna do with this crawl space so that it's done right. Maybe a better way to say it is, how should this have been done right the first time? The crawl space under the old sunroom is accessible through a small hole in the basement. There's not much headroom, there are a few posts supporting a beam, and the floor is lumpy. The other crawl space is accessible from above through the subfloor. We're gonna hide the framing too, to make it a little easier to outline the plan. Both crawl spaces share the same solution though, styrofoam insulation and a spray polyurethane foam froth pack. Begin with the floor notching around posts and piecing in as needed. Next, glue styrofoam sheets to the foundation wall and tape the seams tight. Also tape the floor seams doing your best to get a good bond. Now you can seal the corners and edges with spray foam and then seal each seam on the floor and walls. When we put the framing back, we can see another important area for air sealing and insulation, the rim joist assembly. Seal this area also with spray foam, making sure to encapsulate all the pieces of the assembly from rim joist to styrofoam. The other thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add heat to this space. So we're actually gonna put some thin tube radiators in here so we will actually be actively conditioning this space which is what's required by the code. Installing two inch styrofoam to the floor and walls is pretty straightforward. You just cut the pieces and plop them in place. It's best if the floor is perfectly level but it rarely is due to all kinds of obstructions. Because we're going to seal the seams with spray foam the seams don't need to be perfect. 
You can cut styrofoam panels with a utility knife, but for thick panels like these, it's easier to use a skill saw. When the floor is complete, Scott turns to the walls. He uses construction adhesive on the backside, and then he sticks the panels to the foundation walls. After taping the seams, it's time to seal up the connections with some spray foam and a froth pack. All right, spray foam insulation. It's a big part of how we build today. It's one of the key ingredients in our building type. And DuPont happens to make something called froth pack, which is kind of a more portable version if you don't need to necessarily foam an entire house. You've got some smaller areas that you need to address. Um, comes in a red version and a green version in a variety of different sizes. What you need to know is green is for air sealing and red is fire rated. So if you're doing a big crawl space, rim joist, it's gonna be red. If you're doing weight pockets and things like that, uh, around windows, it's gonna be for air sealing, you're gonna use green. And I don't care how much you think you know about spray foam, always stop and read the instructions before you use any chemical product like this. Um, it's not hard to use, but it's really important that you use it properly, safely, and it's got some very specific steps that it walks you through before you use it. Well, if we open up the box of froth pack, inside we're gonna find uh, we have a gun with two hoses. We have a series of nozzles. I'll talk about those in a second. And below that, we have two canisters, chemical A and chemical B. So chemical A is an isocyanide, and chemical B is a polyol. And the two, when they come together, they create foam. And that's what we're after. And the two chemicals travel independently through these two hoses until they reach the nozzles. And they give you two different kinds of nozzles for two different kinds of applications. This nozzle, the blue one, has a fan tip. So if I'm spraying like a uh, rim joist or a wall cavity where I need a big wide spray, I'm gonna use a fan tip. This is like a fill tip. If I'm spraying to fill a large opening, to fill a weight pocket, I'm gonna use this tip. Both of them have this very cool spirally deal here which allows the chemicals to still maintain their separation up until they reach the very last point here where they, they mix and they instantly start to react as they come out of the tip. So important to note, you get about 15 to 30 seconds between spray applications before your tip is dead. So you wanna plan ahead, be prepared, know how you're gonna move around the room, spray, 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 and when you stop, if you stop for any period of time, just be prepared to have to remove the nozzle, clean the gun, and put in a new nozzle. And that process takes all of about a minute and a half. So it's not a large, laborious process, but you will need to plan on switching out some tips. Before applying the tip to the gun, coat the inside of the gun threads with petroleum jelly to prevent the spray foam from curing inside mm. of it. This is just petroleum jelly, non-pharmaceutical type. And um, they want you to put it in there so the foam doesn't stick to it. Um, I also put it on the outside of my nozzle here um, because sometimes foam blows back and I want to be able to clean my nozzle quickly and I, I can do that if I've got some jelly on there. After Michael jellies up the tips, he climbs into his safety gear just like it shows in the book. A Tyvek suit to protect skin and clothing, a respirator to protect his lungs, and gloves to protect his hands. And now it's into the crawl space with him, where he skim coats the seams, methodically working from the far corner back to the hole in the wall, strategically placing the foam box where he can hit targets without having to stop for more than the dreaded 30 seconds causing a tip change. In the interest of moving quickly and thoroughly, he hits the rim joist assembly while he's in the spot. Now he can move to the more civilized crawl space, the one with no subfloor above. Again, he works from the far corner and across the back, hitting the wall seams and rim joist all the way to the opposite end. Then he moves back across the rim joist again, moving quickly but with a plan. Now, he moves toward the front of the house, sealing the floor seams from one end to the other.
At the end, he fills in some wall foam that was excavated earlier for some electrical work. And now we watch the foam expand. Been a little heavy there. And we're ready to go heavy on next week's adventure, out of the crawl space and into the attic, where we'll explore the effect of all the air sealing that we've been doing that's out of sight. We'll look at small mechanical system components that are targeted to the spaces they serve. In the attic, we'll check out the air handler unit from Mitsubishi that cools the second floor, but the real treat is between the ceiling joist downstairs. The Easy Fit Mini Split Ceiling Cassette is made for remodeling situations like this for bringing heat or cool to places where it's difficult to run ductwork. And all that's next time on Building Resilience.